in the school way, you know, the stuff. Oh, yeah. Good. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Noontime Lecture Conference. Um, this uh, morning slash early afternoon, I am pleased to uh, introduce uh, Colleen Grogan, PhD. Um, she is the Deborah R. and Edgar D. Janata Professor at the University of Chicago and the Deputy Dean of Curriculum in the Crown Family School. Dr. Grogan's new book, August 2023, with Oxford University Press, is entitled Grow and Hide, the History of America's Healthcare State reveals the true extent of public financing behind a system which is intentionally and repeatedly presented as predominantly private. She documents the consequences of grow and hide, fragmentation and lack of health care planning, a lack of health care planning, profiteering and the rise of capital markets in healthcare and extreme inequality. Her new research project focuses on the role of financialization in the US healthcare system and its implications for health policies and health equity. She is PI and co-investigator, respectively, for two NIH-funded grants to study the impact of Medicaid-managed care coverage policies on access to care and health outcomes for persons with substance use disorder. Uh, welcome from across across the street, and thank you for being here, and we're very excited to hear your talk. The Dr. Grogan. Great. Thank you. Everyone can hear me okay? Super. Um, so hopefully, uh, well, for those of you who came to the Davis lecture last fall um, and heard me speak, um, maybe you wanna have lunch, but this will be, it's not all that different. So just to give you the heads up, um, I see a couple faces in the crowd. Um, okay, so as um, uh, it, 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 the, the, my bio kind of indicated, I just had this book come out um, called Grow and Hide and, um, this project really emerged from the book. I did, a um, when I got to chapter eight, I wrote about the rise of kind of the movement of capital um, markets of the, the banks um, becoming very interested in investing in the healthcare system, um, starting really in 1965 and, and kind of did a lot of that historical work um, to, to understand what was going on and how government was playing a role in subsidizing it. Um, so this project really grew out of that book. Um, uh, and um, I just wanted to share some of that with you today. Um, so, should I use the clicker? What should I do to have it go forward? There we go, thank you. So to start, I just wanna acknowledge um, some co-authors I have in this work. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit from um, a publication that was uh, just published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, with uh, Joe Brush, who's here in the Public Health Sciences Department um, at University of Chicago, and Victor Roy, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow, MD, PhD in, um, uh, at Yale University. And then my other colleague, Miriam Lagason, she and I have really been focusing on this larger project, trying to understand how financialization of health has moved into um, the political system and how that impacts our shaping of health policy through, through health politics. Um, so I wanna start with um, this, uh, this article um, uh, and just share with you our main, you know, kind of what was our, why, why did we write this article? What were, what were we trying to do? Um, so we called it the, calling it the financialization of health. And um, the main, one of the main points we're trying to get across in this article is, there, as I'm sure all of you in the room have been probably reading a lot because it's it's been very much in the popular press, in the media, um, in newspaper articles, Congress is holding hearings, focused primarily on the role of private equity in healthcare. And so that's very important. Um, and we, I'll talk about that a tiny bit and more when I get to the politics. Um, but we wanted to uh, write a piece that says it's more than just private equity there's financialization throughout the system. So you'll see that um, in, in the article, we, we kind of break it down to there are financial actors and it's not just private equity, um, but from the financial industry, there's hedge funds, venture capital, 
um, REITs, which are real estate investment trusts, um, playing a really significant role. So lots of different financial instruments. Um, it's not just private equity. So if we only kind of zeroly focus on that, we're, we're going to miss some other um, uh, important um, dynamics at play. Uh, but we have that, we have financialization of healthcare entities themselves, and then the financial sector, um, how it impacts people on the ground. And we um, are kind of arguing that it um, it's beginning to act like a social determinant of health, um, the, the, the impact of the finance. Um, so just to get into each of those levels a little bit, um, when we focus on um, the role of the financial industry, um, there's direct acquisition by financial actors. That's kind of really thinking about private equity, right? Or there's a lot of concern about how they leverage um, they they acquire companies. Um, they leverage. Uh, they do that through significant um, leveraging of debt, um, and uh, and that has um, the way in which their time their short time horizons to make to increase value significantly and then exit out of the system raises concerns about what they're doing to the structure of companies and the management of companies in that very short time horizon. Um, so just in the past decade and I'm sure many of you have already heard these um, statistics, uh, private equity firms have completed more than 8,000 um, transactions or you know, what are also called deals um, involving healthcare entities, um, uh, estimating nearly a um, trillion dollars. So the amount of money in these deals is really, really significant. Um, uh, but again, um, uh, uh, there's, it's more than, um, than just private equity. So uh, I mentioned real estate investment trusts. They um, acquire healthcare properties and lease the real estate back to the healthcare facilities. So sometimes you'll have private equity acquire a firm and then use uh, what's called, you know, the, the acronym REITs. Um, they're actually more interested in the real estate that that company is on than they are in the company itself, right? And so I think a really good example of this was the acquisition of Hanneman Hospital that, again, many of you might have read about because it got a lot of press um, in Philadelphia, uh, that there was um, really significant, the, the real estate um, in central Philadelphia that Hanneman Hospital sat on uh, is very valuable. Um, and so uh, this was a good opportunity to make a lot of money just on the real estate itself. Um, and so what's important about that is the company before it was acquired actually owned the real estate, owned the facility uh, after it's acquired by PE, um, it now has to lease back um, the, um, its, its real estate. That's one of the major um, uh, mechanisms that PE will use. Um, and then uh, we also uh, have venture capitalists, which most people think of venture capitalists as um, having a really good impact on the healthcare system in terms of innovation. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today. I think there might be some evidence for that. I think there also might, there's not uh, a whole lot of good evidence as to whether the amount of capital um, spent by uh, VC is really leading to significant innovation. But the main thing to think about with venture capital is that it, it starts um, small startup companies on a, a kind of capital trajectory. <laughs> so usually what um, a small startup will want to do is to get VC money, but then eventually be, to be bought by a private equity firm. Um, and so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's part of a larger capital trajectory that's, um, that should be thought of in the system as um, perhaps there's innovation to begin with, but if it's acquired by private equity, then what's happening to what we think of initially as disruption or innovation, um, is that still allowed to, um, to really take off? Okay, and then the other thing that's really important are the the people giving um, private equity, not the people, but the, the institutions giving private equity so much money. So what's, what's behind all this? Um, most of the investment into pension, uh, into private equity um, or hedge funds is coming from um, institutional investors and primarily pension funds. Um, so uh, we'll get to more of this a little bit later about the politics, but that really um, shapes the financial, the, the kind of invested interest in this whole system, right? That now you have um, 
uh, um, a lot of state governments, right, that have major pension funds uh, to invest in, um, and there are lots of them are investing in private equity firms. If they also are taking on responsibility to think about regulating private equity or the financial industry, there's a little, there's a, a potential conflict of interest there, right? Um, okay. Uh, so um, an important uh, aspect to thinking about the role of the financial industry, especially in healthcare, but more broadly as well, is just that so much of what's happening is very hidden because of the lack of regulations. Um, and so many people have now started to refer to this as sort of a shadow lending market or shadow banking, shadow finance, um, because of the lack of disclosure regulations, lack of transparency. Okay, so that's the the financial actors. Um, what do we mean by financialization of healthcare entities? Um, <clears throat> what we mean is that um, healthcare entities start to behave like financial firms. Uh, so if we just take the case of nonprofit hospitals, so that's also kind of important, right? That it's not just for-profit healthcare entities. Um, we see this behavior among um, many of the large, um, in fact, academic medical centers um, that we sit in right, right here, um, starting to behave like their own investment firms, right? Um, so a very important finding came out um, uh, just that was published, uh, I think just last year, if not two years ago, um, which found that um, uh, nonprofit hospitals reported, some of the largest hospitals reported significant losses in um, uh, in in um, in earnings in in their their net uh, uh, net revenue, um, and 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 suggested that it was due to a decrease in um, in in their operating revenue, in their revenues, right? And so um, in sort of discuss, you know, even their kind of uh, lobbying to Congress suggested that they were, it had a lot to do with reimbursement and not getting enough in terms of reimbursement payments. Uh, but when this author looked into the, the actual accounting from uh, large nonprofit hospitals, they found that for the largest nonprofits, it was due to investment losses. Right, so they're taking their they they're losing money not because of operating loss of operating revenue or too large operating expenses. They really lost money because they lost money on their investments. And again, it's pretty large. It was 164 percent return. Um, okay. The other way that um, healthcare entities can behave like financial firms is through. Uh, um, uh, share repurchases, or what's also been called um, share buybacks. And uh, our co-author, uh, uh, Victor Roy, has written a lot about this um, focused on the pharmaceutical company. Um, and so you'll have um, uh, this phenomenon where companies buy back their shares to increase the value of the remaining shares. Right, um, and so it's kind of an artificial way you could argue to increase the value of the company's share, and um, it it does increase, it does provide quite a bit of profit to um, companies that pursue this strategy. So um, he found that nearly seventy billion in profit in just twenty uh, twenty two was due to share buyback uh, strategy, um, and this is was nearly an increase of three hundred percent in just a decade. Okay, um, so just a couple examples of how healthcare entities behave like financial actors themselves. Um, but then how does it filter down to impacting um, people on the ground, the, the general public or um, even patients? Um, so one phenomenon is a dramatic increase in the use of medical credit cards. Um, so healthcare entities as, um, you know, there's actually, I think many of you have probably heard about this as well, since un unfortunately in the past decade, ironically after the Affordable Care Act was passed, there's actually been quite a dramatic increase in medical debt. Um, and one response to that has been um, from many private equity backed firms to offer medical credit cards so that patients can pay back their debt through the use of um, medical credit cards. Um, 
uh, they have pretty high um, interest rates um, and, um, and provide a lot of profit to the companies that offer these medical credit cards. Um, and then, of course, uh, many people um, um, are, are in, in, in our, our broader system, uh, the role of finance plays a large role, right? So um, uh, uh, people are expected to um, have a credit card, um, uh, take on debt, um, uh, to purchase a whole number of things in our society. And if that leads to um, more impoverishation, then that's also kind of related, uh, uh, related to the social determinants of health. So I'm covering a lot of ground here, but that's, that's the broad kind of framework of how we want to think about financialization as, as through the whole system, not just one actor at this level entering into the healthcare system. Okay, um, now the other important aspect of this is that uh, the, the state is actually encouraging a lot of this financialization activity. And so that's really um, important. Um, so first through a whole series of deregulations, uh, it, allowed it, uh, it allowed the entrance of financial actors into the healthcare system, really starting in uh, quite significantly in the 1980s, but even prior. Um, reliable public financing um, is really important for the for, uh, financial actors' interests in the healthcare system, right? So um, one of the major uh, areas of interest in terms of private equity investment in the healthcare um, sector right now is around Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and uh, many different aspects of investments around Medicare Advantage plans, but that's the hottest ticket right now. And of course, it's, it's Medicare dollars, so it's 100% publicly financed. Um, uh, and then uh, the role of social policy. So um, just to highlight deregulation, um, financial markets uh, were deregulated in the 1970s and 80s. Um, by 2000, um, uh, there was um, an exclusion of um, complex financial instruments such as uh, derivatives and credit uh, default swaps. So many of you probably heard about these instruments when we had the financial collapse in 2008. Um, but this all led to um, a allowed the financial sector to shift significant capital into private investment vehicles like private equity and hedge funds. Um, so again, the state played a very significant role in bringing about uh, these new inst instruments. Um, interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead. Uh, so, and then second, as I talked about, reliable public financing, public funding of the healthcare system has reached 65% of national health expenditures. Um, so if you just think about it logically, it, and in so many different areas that uh, the financial industry is investing in the healthcare system, a lot of it um, beyond Medicare is, is publicly subsidized dollars. So behavioral health has been a major increase um, in terms of financial investments. And most of the increases in behavioral health are coming from Medicaid um, coverage uh, because it was so significant to add this coverage under the ACA. Okay. Um, uh, so one thing that many people ask is why would public funding be attractive to private equity? I think many of you might know that Medicare Advantage payments are actually quite high. They're very generous. Um, uh, I had a, um, a, a graph, unfortunately, that I should have put in these slides um, that shows sort of the, the, the margin from Medicare Advantage plans compared to other um, private sector plans um, and Medicaid managed care plans. And the, 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 the margins are quite a bit higher on the Medicare Advantage plans. So even though we think of public reimbursement as being low, especially like from the hospital's perspective, we think of we want to go after those private insurance dollars. Um, it really depends on what aspect of the um, healthcare industry you're investing in, whether those public dollars are low or not. Um, but there's also something beyond just the absolute amount of the reimbursement. 
the, the reliability of public financing is very important. So the fact that Medicaid and Medicare are entitlement programs, that makes it much more easy to think about a reliable return on investment. If you first do your due diligence to see, can you make money on Medicaid dollars? If you know you can make money, then um, even though state payments can be unreliable, knowing that the, the uh, funding will be there, I think is, is much more reliable on the public side than the private side. Okay, um, and then um, just a, a part of the, the lack of um, co cohesive social welfare net um, adds to um, uh, why, um, uh, uh, why medical debt is rising so much. Um, I'm gonna move ahead here uh, to, to move on to the second part um, of the talk, which is um, thinking about if we have this financialization of health, and it's moving through all these, these three levels that I talked about, right? Um, how does that then impact health politics or our structure of health policy? Um, and in political science, there's this uh, phenomenon called what, what people, um, what scholars call policy feedback effects. And the idea is, is pretty simple that when you create state policy, um, that has an influence on it, it, it create it, it can it gives money to the stakeholder to particular stakeholders which then have an invested interest in getting involved in the political system to further shape that policy right so we have as I said state uh, state policies that have impacted financialization in the first place we now have the financial industry healthcare entities and other actors that I'll talk about that have been kind of activated from these uh, this encouragement of financialization. Um, and so now they have a real invested interest in um, helping to continue to shape healthcare policy going forward. Um, so that brings me to how financialization of health has, has produced this phenomenon of financialization of health politics. Okay. So there's six main factors um, that I wanna discuss that I think really describe um, the financialization of health politics. Uh, so I'll start with ownership um, opacity. Um, and uh, so one, I, I kind of already talked about this a little bit that um, there's just a lack of government regulation around private sector, and here I'm particularly thinking about private equity, but it applies to hedge funds as well. Um, uh, uh, there's, there's just very little regulation to make a number of these um, deals and transactions transparent, right? Um, and so it makes it really hard uh, to, it makes it hard for individuals to know what's happening, but it makes it hard, even if you want to understand what's happening, researchers are really challenged um, to even just study what's the impact of, of financialization on health. So I think nursing homes are a good example of this, where how lack of, um, um, of transparency has an impact on the politics. So nursing homes was one of the first sectors of the healthcare system that private equity was interested in investing in. Um, and it really started in 2000. Um, there was uh, started to be significant investment first in nursing homes. Um, and so by 2007, there was actually a hearing in Congress on um, PE owned or PE backed nursing homes and, and concerns about quality of care because there were a number of uh, newspaper exposés, but also qualitative researchers studying what was happening in PE back nursing homes, um, and you know, and raising concerns about quality. Um, uh, so they held a hearing, and um, private uh, private equity um, argued the the PE back nursing homes argued that um, yes, they sort of acknowledge there are bad apples, but this doesn't describe um, this. There's this doesn't describe everybody, right? That there's always gonna be a few bad apples. Well, if you don't have any quantitative data um, to show that it is a systemic problem, then your influence in this hearing is just very, very minimal, right? And they really did, it was sort of one anecdotal story against another anecdotal story. And very, part of the reason there weren't any quantitative studies is that there was no data on, um, on what was exactly were PE backed 
entities. So we finally got um, a, a, a good study in 2021 by Gupta et al. Again, many of you might have already heard about this, uh, showing that in a 20, uh, 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 a 15 year period, I think they started in um, 2000 to 2010 or to, um, I think they went into 2015, but it was at least a 10 year period. It was a pretty long period of time, but it didn't come out until 2021. It was important when it came out because it was also in the middle of COVID. There were lots of concerns about quality of care in nursing homes. Um, and they were able to show that PE backed nursing homes on average have a higher mortality rate than non PE backed. And they attributed um, the higher mortality rate to um, to a common activity in PE back nursing homes, which is just to have fewer staff per patient ratio. Um, and so eventually now Congress has responded uh, to have some regulations around what the, uh, what the um, staff to patient ratio should look like. Um, but what's important about this is, you know, we get a hearing in 2007 and we don't have good evidence until 2021. Uh, when Miriam and I have been doing interviews and kind of bring it uh, with, with private equity firms and other financial actors, we'll bring up the case of nursing, the nursing home findings. Um, and they have said to us, you know, that's, that's pretty late in the game. Like we're not even interested in investing in nursing homes anymore. We're, we're done with that. Um, and so when you think politically, if we can only act until we have good evidence um, and we're taught the action that people are asking for is transparency um, until the, the harm has already been done, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's problematic. But it adds to, again, the politics because you, um, uh, it, it kind of bolsters the strength of the financial industry, right? Um, so lots has been written about the secrecy and the lack of ability to really understand ownership structure, the complicated ownership structures because of the lack of transparency. So just other people writing about the problem of, um, of, of the shadow um, industry. So the second phenomenon, um, that I want to talk about is, um, is, is rhetorical power. And here, uh, it's it, on the one hand, very, this is, this just describes what interest just interest groups do generally, right? That everybody or, or lots of groups, whether you're in, uh, in a, in, um, in lobbying Congress or you're lobbying city council, um, you will use your rhetorical, um, uh, uh, strength or your, your, you, you will use rhetoric to try to make the best case, right, for what your company or your, um, your, your firm or program does. Um, so that's not surprising. And you see that with, um, uh, you know, private equity, lo lobbyists for private equity. Uh, but I think what makes what's unique in the healthcare realm is that their promise for providing capital in the healthcare system is that you need capital to create innovation, right? And because our healthcare system is already in such a difficult, it's, there's so many problems in the healthcare system that we're very vulnerable to arguments about disruption, right? Because we know, in fact, we do need disruption. We need to really drastically, uh, for many areas, really reform what's happening. Um, and there aren't uh, many good alternatives to private capital. So government does subsidize private private capital, but that's also very hidden. So actors in in the in the healthcare system, when we've talked to them through a number of interviews, um, they will say to us, "Well, you know, one for example, a uh, woman worked in private equity, or I'm sorry, worked on health equity, um, uh, and and in particular racial concerns around improving racial health equity. Uh, her whole career, she um, worked in academic medical center, then went on to work for the Obama administration, um, worked for a number of consulting firms that were focused on consulting around health equity, um, and eventually she was approached by a private." equity firm. And she said, at first, I thought they just got the wrong number um, because she was like, why would you be interested in me? Um, but they said, no, 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 we really want you at the table. Um, and, uh, and they said, you know, we need that voice at the table because we're really concerned about private equity. Um, and so her response back to me was, you know, 
what this this is how we do things in this country. We 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 rely on private capital, and so if I'm going to be able to make any difference, if I can really just dis, uh, disrupt what's currently happening, I have to work with private equity, right? Um, so it's this um, these arguments, these rhetorical arguments around disruption, and the lack of alternative arguments. I think is really persuasive um, in in our in the current structure in the U.S. healthcare system, um, and and also plays a role in the politics. Um, the third really important factor is this, um, this issue of blame avoidance. So um, again, and, and these, these factors are not mutually exclusive, they're interrelated, right? So for an individual patient, for example, um, in a PE-backed hospital uh, that might be experiencing concerns about quality of care, they might be really upset about what the hospital is doing and might complain to their congressional member about this particular hospital. But they don't attribute any of the quality concerns to the private equity firm because they have absolutely no idea that it's owned by the private equity firm. Or if it's a subsidiary of a private equity firm, which oftentimes it is, right? So again, these ownership structures are very opaque. Um, and it's very hard for individuals in the system to have any idea whether a, a, the, a, finance, uh, a, a financial actor is playing a role in their quality of care. So there's significant blame avoidance, right? That So what the other way to talk about this is that private equity or the financial industry benefits from blame avoidance, right? That it, it is not directly blamed for problems that occur. It's the, it's the company that they acquired that's blamed. Um, so I want to say that these first three factors I just talked about are really successful at keeping um, private ec equity off the political agenda in general. Now, that sounds um, a little bit, uh, doesn't sound exactly right in this moment because private equity is more on the agenda. Um, uh, than it than it was previously, and I, we can talk about that more. Um, Elizabeth Warren is working on a bill right now. There's some other actors. They're very concerned about Seward Hospital in Massachusetts. Um, but uh, as of you know, up until this year, uh, it really was very much not on the agenda. One exception is surprise billing. Um, so I want to talk about that just a little bit as an example. Um, and so the, what we find on their surprise billing is lobbying activity that's very opaque and then the influence of these hidden coalitions. So what do I mean by that? Um, so first I just wanna to get to the, um, the main thing that happened with um, the passage of the No Surprises Act. Uh, so the main thing that happened is, um, I assume most of you in this room know about surprise billing, but I'll just say the kind of basic phenomenon is that um, an individual, oftentimes it's an insured individual, right? It's, it's almost always an insured individual who thinks that they're, they're using an in-network provider, um, you know, number of stories about somebody that uh, needed to have a surgery done, made sure that the hospital was in-network, um, checked it all beforehand, went into surgery. Um, at the time, the, um, the surgeon asked for... Um, uh, some ER consultants to come in and consult on the surgery. And these consultants came from a private equity emergency, you know, uh, a physician emergency uh, owned company. And that was their role was to consult on, on surgeries, but they charged an out of network charge. Okay. What hospitals then did was pass that charge onto the patient. So hence the surprise bill. So that's that's just one example of something that was happening. And these bills were not, um, um, you know, were not uh, minor. Many of them, you know, were around fifteen thousand dollars when you didn't you thought everything was covered, right? So hugely egregious um, because again the patient couldn't also couldn't consent to it. The patient was in the emergency in the in the operating room, right? Um, so bipartisan support for doing something about this problem of surprise billing. Um, the reason private equity is important is that all of the surprise billing uh, behavior that was occurring were from private equity backed firms. And they created the, the, um, the 
strategy, right? This kind of ER consulting strategy um, that, that was their innovation in the system um, to, to make money. Um, and so private equity was very much implicated in surprise billing as they are around the, you know, air ambulance uh, activity that's happening. It's kind of anywhere you see surprise billing, private equity is behind it. Um, so when we pass the No Surprises Act, what the act does is it, it says um, uh, there should be um, no out-of-network billing that is passed on to the patient. So it eliminated the out-of-network billing to the patient, but it did not eliminate out-of-network billing. Um, what, what became very contentious in the act was if you have an out-of-network bill, who, who pays it? It's the insurance company that's going to pay it. And how, what should be the rate, right? And should it be um, a benchmark price or should it go to arbitration? And what private equity was lobbying for was arbitration and the insurance companies wanted a benchmark rate. What won out was arbitration. So what you have here in the act, and many people have said, no surprises act is an example of bipartisan work and really helps the American public and Congress can act to do good things for the American public. I, I don't have such a rosy story about the No Surprises Act. And the reason is that um, the, the root of the problem, I think, was not addressed, right? So number one, the root of the problem is the behavior of private equity, right? And the lack of transparency. Um, also, uh, uh, this behavior is still being allowed, right? And when it goes to arbitration, the reason private equity wanted arbitration is that they can lawyer up, which they have, and, um, and, and they know they will get a higher rate out of arbitra arbitration than the benchmark billing, which is why they were advocating for it. And that's what they got. So on almost every measure, I would say private equity in the end won out. So this shows kind of the power of private equity, even when, when there's some, a, a bill that goes through Congress that does uh, that very much relates to their role in the system. They are almost uh, not, they are, they are minimally impacted, right? Um, okay. The active lobbying, um, the main thing here is that they, um, they, they lobbied quite a bit against surprise billing, um, but used dark money to do the lobbying. So it took quite a while to even figure out who was behind the anti the lobbying efforts against surprise billing. They they uh, uh, did lots of the lobbying behind a group called Physician Unity Group, um, and you know to to kind of present um, a point of view that physicians are against legislation um, for uh, to eliminate surprise billing. Okay. Um, Again, the, the problem with our lobbying data is it, it looks at the companies lobbying that are acquired by PE, and we still don't have a good sense of PE's role behind the lobbying efforts. So we have some data on uh, private equity or financial firms doing direct lobbying, but they are often um, playing a role behind the, 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 the PE-backed companies within the system, and we miss a lot of that. So one example is um, nursing homes do a lot of lobbying, um, but and, and health systems, of course, uh, no, in, in the lobbying efforts that are captured in, in data sets looking at um, uh, amounts of money and, um, and the amount of lobbying, um, it doesn't show uh, the role of private equity behind that. So we see increases of PE directly affiliated, but I think it's even higher is the point of what this graph is showing. Okay. Um, so the other thing, um, uh, the, the fifth factor that I wanna mention um, that's related um, to surprise billing um, is, is what we're finding from our interviews. And again, this is work in progress, so we're still, still doing interviews. Um, but one thing that's sort of really struck us in our interviews is we thought we were gonna primarily talk to people in the financial industry to understand what they're doing, to reveal some of these practices, to maybe talk to people um, that have experienced the role of financialization in the healthcare system, have a better sense of that. But what we found through the interviews we've done to date is, um, again, and th this relates to the, the financialization of health, is that many, many groups are acting, have their own interests 
in financialization. And so um, part of the reason, for example, in the surprise billing legislation or the No Surprises Act that PE was not implicated is that the insurance companies really argued against arbitration, but they didn't in their, in their testimony, in their arguing, they said nothing about the problem of private equity. And at first we were kind of surprised by that because they were not getting a good deal at all through this process of surprise billing. Um, and it, was, it would be easy to implicate private equity in that. But the reason that insurance companies are not interested in implicating private equity is that private equity is also very much involved in, um, in acquiring different payer groups, right? And uh, financial, the insurance industries, right? The, this is a whole large industry. They have many of their own financial arms. So they benefit from many of the regulations that private equity benefits from on the financial industry, if you see what I mean, right? So they, there's no, they, they have a, a larger interest in not implicating private equity. So these are the kind of an example of the hidden coalitions um, uh, that bolster up the role of private equity, even though um, they may not be directly backed by a private equity firm. Um, we've talked to a number of um, consultancy groups who are doing a lot of the due diligence for private equity. Many of um, these firms hire people who, current, who previously worked in government. They really understand reimbursement policy. Um, uh, they're good data analysts and um, and so oftentimes private equity firms will acquire a healthcare firm and they don't actually know all the complicated things about the healthcare system or the complications of reimbursement, but they hire these consulting firms to do the due diligence. Now, consulting firms, these many consulting firms now that are emerging um, have, they, they're, that's their bread and butter. Most of their business is coming from private equity now. Um, and so they also become part of this kind of hidden coalition. They don't want that business to go away. Um, lawyers as well. Um, you know, there's a huge, uh, uh, business, um, coming from, PE backed firms that need good lawyers that are willing to work and advocate on the corporatization side, um, on corporate law uh, and financial law. So in most law, law firms now, we have courses on private equity, right, to really understand those regulations. Um, same with, you know, in the Harris School, many of our, many of the students end up working for uh, consulting firms that work for private equity. So. Um, very, uh, I think, a very important phenomenon uh, to uh, to understand around the politics. Okay. Um, we do have some advocates uh, that are that are fighting against uh, private equity or trying to think about uh, more regulations. Um, the Private Equity Stakeholders Project is an example of that. Um, but we really don't have a whole, we really don't have many others. Um, and so you don't, in a good kind of uh, competitive political system, you have countervailing factors, right? You have uh, debate happening. You have people on both sides really trying to bring these issues to the fore. So we, as a populace, can um, can understand, you know, what what the implications are and make better decisions. Um, we don't have a whole lot of countervailing um, actors here in this political um, system that involves private equity, um, and I think the reason for that. Uh, is related to um, the financialization of health, right? That we, most of the actors that we would think would be playing a countervailing role are actually um, kind of becoming financial actors themselves, has an invested interest in the system. Um, now, I do think young physicians, young provider groups might be a, a, a group that's going to emerge um, a, 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 as a countervailing force, um, but, but uh, hasn't really been there yet. Um, so I think um, uh, I think I'll uh, this uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. I forgot that I sent you the one with the interview data. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and open it up for questions. So, um, like, say private equity, but how many private equity firms are talking about? Is it like, right? is it 100? 
And is it, are they a monolith as far as what their desires are in the system? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really a really good question. Um, so, you know, the just, so it is a lot of of different firms, um, and I'm sorry that I I didn't have a graph on just the the kind of basics of how many firms have moved into the system. But if you if I would have shown you a graph um, from especially since 2010, um, the number of firms investing in the healthcare system it's just gone like this. Um, and in the number of deals has increased into every sector, almost every sector of the healthcare system, and the amount of money again adding up to like trillions. Um, so it's very significant. Now, what's important though is uh, there was an article, or not an article, a report from MedPAC, the Medicare um, Advisory Commission um, uh, that oversees the Medicare program. And Congress had asked MedPAC to look into the role of private equity in our healthcare system. And um, this was just a couple of years ago, I think the report came out in um, 2022. And um, in doing research, looking at, uh, there's a, a data set called from PitchBook, um, uh, and they collect data on private equity, what private equity is doing across the economy, but have look um, also at what's happening in the healthcare system. Uh, and, <clears throat> So MedPAC used data from PitchBook, which almost everybody does. Um, but the way that PitchBook gets this data is by scraping the web. Because there's no, there's again, there's no regulation saying that private when private equities acquire a company, they have to report that to um, Cong, you know, to the federal government or to uh, some states have some emerging regulations around reporting, but for the most part, they, they don't have, we don't have reporting requirements. So we don't have a database that allows us to understand the complexity of these deals and ownership structures. Now, that's important because it's, it, it actually is very hard to collect these data. The colleagues I know that do now have data sets like the Gupta et al., it took them a good two years of uh, going through using PitchBook data to just connect it to all the different firms in the system over time to then label a firm as PE backed, non PE backed. And so, what MedPAC found is at any given point in time, they said for hospitals, it's only 2%, or no, hospitals was higher as 5%. They said for uh, nursing homes, it was around 15%. And I think they, uh, um, they might have looked at one other like physician practice groups. And it was, a, but the point is from their report is that it was very low. And what they said is two things. One, um, uh, and they said this up front, the data is really, really bad. And so we don't feel confident at all in the figures we're gonna give you, but this is the only data we have, so we're gonna use it. And if based on, based on these data, the percent involvement is low, okay? So that kind of, so talking to another colleague after this report came out, he said, and I, you know, reading my paper, he was like, well, you're saying this is a big deal, but MedPAC said, it's not a big deal. We don't have to worry about it. And so the problem, so, so yes, I think MedPAC suggests to some people that we don't have to worry about it. In the MedPAC report, if you look at that at the very end, they also call for transparency and disclosure, right? Because they're not actually confident in their own estimates. And the other problem is that when PE um, is investing and then it sells, it, it, there's no reason to think after the sale that the owners, the behavior of the firm changes, right? Back to not being PE backed, right? That those that 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 if if you've decreased your staff, for example, what nursing homes do, if you have a low patient uh, uh, staff to patient ratio because uh, what PE implemented when they owned you, now they sell you and you get sold off to some other firm, or you you're left with a lot of debt. You have no ability if if you're left with a lot of debt, which is usually what happens. You have no ability to then increase staff. Right. So in these studies that look at PE backed versus non PE backed, one thing that's also really limited is that we don't know. Have you ever had uh, the influence of a financial entity in your firm? And that that 
involvement is much, much higher. And that didn't get captured at all in the MedPAC report. So I think in some sectors, it's actually really hard to find um, entities that have no financial involvement whatsoever. Um, now, they're going to be different levels and different engagement. Um, but I think it's important for us to really understand that complexity. And unfortunately, because we don't even we don't have regulations, we, it's really hard for us to do. So we're kind of in this catch 22 of like you asked that question, which is really important. I should be able to give you a good answer to it. And it's actually hard to, to do that right now. Um, so the private equity firms will say, especially uh, Welsh Carlson, for example, who has been investing in healthcare for a long, long time, you know, they'll argue uh, we're one of the high, we only invest in high quality. We're a good investor. Um, they're, you know, holding conferences, showcasing their por portfolio companies to say, these are all portfolio companies that truly are doing high quality of care. Um, so just to give you the other side of the argument is that, no, they're not, they would say, we're not monolithic. Um, we're not like these other bad actors. We do, we invest in good things. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there is that, that potential that it's not monolithic. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's such a good question. Um, so many people ha ask uh, a, a related question that I think you're getting at, which is how is PE different from for profit? You know, if you're a for profit entity, wouldn't you also be maximizing profits? And how would private equity owned? They're also just trying to increase value. How could they, if you're already maximizing profits, when private equity acquires you, they've kind of maxed out on on making profit, right? So the answer to that is um, because private equity acquires companies by leveraging debt, um, they uh, and and uh, they work with the C-suite to implement uh, some reforms. That some so there's there's a number of different arguments here, but one argument is that. Um, uh, because they don't have shareholders to speak to, there, there's very little kind of accountability in terms of some of the organizational reforms that can be made, right? There's, there's not a whole lot of public pushback on what could be really unpopular reforms. So some studies have found, for example, that um, there are much higher staff uh, layoffs after a company is acquired by PE. And part of the argument for why for-profit wouldn't act in this way, is that there's still many for-profit firms are, are, um, are public and they have shareholders they need to speak to and they have their, their, the data is much more public. And so they, wanna, they have to make a profit within constraints. And the argument is that private equity has very few, has, has, doesn't have as many constraints on the ways in which they can make profit or increase value um, because they're hidden. And in addition, they don't have as many constraints because when they sell after five to seven years, um, they, uh, they can leave that portfolio company with a lot of debt. And so many uh, portfolio companies that have been owned by private equity backed firms that are then sold have a much higher likely, likelihood of bankruptcy. Um, and so you can, that's when you kind of like acting in ways that are actually bad for the firm. So most firms don't want to behave in ways that lead them to bankruptcy. But if you are a private equity backed firm, the private equity firm can exit and still make money. Still the, the, the um, founders can make money and their investors can make money, even if the firm after it's been sold uh, goes into bankruptcy. So it, it, it allows for these things that in, uh, in, in a for-profit world with more um, transparency um, and without leveraging lots of debt uh, just don't exist. So I think that, that those are two, there's a couple more important differences, but those are two that I think are really salient that people argue make it different than just for-profit. Long-winded answer, but... <laughs> That's 
so I think, I think a lot of us, you know, who are early mid career have very little concept of this part of our job and, and how much it influences our day to day or doesn't. Um, I guess what are your thoughts on how to how the importance, or maybe not importance, but the importance of how we integrate this into medical education um, at, at some level or continuing medical education in some way? And how can we as physicians stand up for what's right in a way that it's not, you know, so time consuming that it becomes our full time job, but that makes for our patients. Yeah, um, that's such a good question. Uh, you know, um, I, I remember, uh, you know, I've, I mean, I, I started teaching in 1994 and I was at Yale at the time and they, and I was in the school of public health and epidemiology and public health, which is in the medical school. And they had me teach a class to first year medical students. Um, and they wanted me to teach kind of intro to, you know, US healthcare system. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this story because it wasn't a it wasn't a required course. It was required to take, but not for grades. So you can imagine, like most of the students were not all that interested. You know, they were taking anatomy and like had lots of other things to worry about. Um, and so I, I remember thinking about that and have thought about it since. Like, what's the right? These are really important. And there were a couple of students who did realize, like, oh, reimbursement really actually is going to impact my practice and how I do care, or it could impact it. I don't. How do I think about that? Um, but most students had just absolutely no idea that it would, and, and so couldn't couldn't internalize the importance of how it would impact their practice. I think by by fourth year, they kind of were getting a sense that it is important. Um, but so it's it's tricky to think about like when should they be introduced to these ideas? When do they have time in the curriculum? Which is like almost no time, right? Like I understand all the complexities of medical education, but especially when you think about um, you know, un unionization efforts, um, physician practices being sold to large healthcare systems. I mean, there's more and more of a sense, I think, among young people and, uh, you know, young to middle career practitioners that they are, that they truly are losing control. They don't have a whole lot of autonomy. And that's not just a feeling. I think that's based in fact. And in capital, the, the acquisition, uh, uh, is playing a role in that, right? Because they're another strategy of private equity, and sorry, I'm throwing a lot at you all, but another strategy um, that's quite common in, in private equity is to acquire small companies or small physician-owned practices, and they do what's called kind of a roll-up, right? So the way that they can eventually make money is to buy several small companies and roll them together so you get economies of scale, right? It makes a lot of sense. Like each individual practice trying to invest in um, um, technology to do billing, right? Doesn't really make sense. It does and some, from that perspective. Like if you roll it up and you have a much larger system, then there's economies of scale. So it adds, it's an easy way, this roll-up strategy, it's a really easy way for private equity to move into a space acquire lots of small firms, roll it all together and then sell it and they make a ton of, you can increase value very quickly. But what that means is that process has led to significant consolidation in our healthcare system, right? So that's why antitrust is now really worried about what private equity has been doing. And there's a lawsuit in Texas about this very issue of whether um, uh, the behavior of roll-ups has led to significant consolidation and anti-competitive behavior. All that to say that that the roll-ups are what you know individual physicians are now working for large, large systems and systems that are almost becoming acting like monopolies um, potentially, right? Um, I, I think they are acting like monopolies. I would agree with the lawsuit um, that there's a real case for this. Um, so you know, yes, physicians should be, should have a much better understanding of what's happening and, um, you know, and, and thinking about, okay, if not being owned, if, 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 if we don't want the infusion of private capital, what's the role of government in thinking about um, capital investments, right? And that's, that's, that's been kind of lost from our discourse, which is the story about the woman working in health equity. It's like, oh, this is how we do things in the US. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. And physicians play, have, a, have a very large influence on, our, on patient opinion and on 
politicians' opinions. So the physicians really did have a coalition to argue for more public investment uh, rather than relying solely on private investment. I think it would be um, it could have an impact. Uh, I'm just curious in the sort of context of uh, laying responsibility. Uh, I've heard some people say, well, doctors are largely to blame because when large physician groups are uh, have the opportunity to be purchased by private equity, because they generally make a lot of money, they accept that without question. I guess I'm curious, is, is that a reasonable criticism or is that or, or not? I I think it's reasonable and also shouldn't be quite so broad sweeping, I guess is how I would put it. But I, I do think um, especially older physicians that are, you know, they own the company, they're nearing towards retirement, private equity comes along, they're willing to buy them out. It, I, it's understandably an attractive, it's a very attractive offer. Um, Private equity is also very willing to tell them, you know, I have a colleague actually who owned a behavioral health company and he sold to a private equity firm. I had a whole conversation with him about, he said, I, I talked to them about, you know, I, I was really worried about my staff. I didn't want them to do things that would hurt my staff or lay off my staff. They promised me they wouldn't do it. And, um, and it was just a couple of years ago, so he still doesn't really know what's going to happen. Um, but it's sort of like it's too good to not take the offer. But um, so I think you have there, you know, it's 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 uh, people are people selling are making a lot of money, and private equity knows that they can offer quite a bit of money to the to the owners, and the attractives are are look really good. But that's why I said I think most of the the opposition is going to come from from younger physicians that are not going to still be reaping those benefits. Yeah. Yeah, um, so for me, the, the reasons I worry, is, I, I mean, I'm kind of worried about the role of the financial industry a, across the economy, to be honest with you. But the reason I think that we should be particularly concerned in the healthcare sector um, kind of takes you back to real basics about what we think about healthcare and is it a public good, right? Um, and, and, I do think we have, you know, the arguments for healthcare as not being a competitive market are very, very strong. You know, we, we've had those arguments since the 1960s, right, from Kenneth Arrow showing that it's not a regular competitive market. And so we always have government really strongly involved in regulating the healthcare system and in providing financing for the healthcare system. So as I kind of talked about um, uh, in the slides, one major concern is it's we're, we're talking about public dollars that are being used and that private equity is making a lot of profit off of public dollars, right? So if we get a lot of innovation for that, then there could be an argument for, well, they're coming in, they're uh, in making a, a, a major investment by acquiring a firm, they're making some changes, they would argue they're creating more innovation, which is why the value of the firm goes up and they're able to sell it for more and exit with a profit. Now they make a profit, but they would say, well, we increase the value. So that's a, a good to society. Now, I think that's the basic question that we should ask ourselves. Like, are we, did we really get something good from that increase in val it, value is the sale price. It's not necessarily value to society. Um, and if, um, Again, if that money going to the private equity firm is public money and we didn't get value to society, 
then we should be, you know, really concerned. And that's that what's that's what makes healthcare different. I mean, and then obviously the other thing that makes healthcare different is sometimes there's actual harms being done to patients, like in the nursing home study that, you know, it, it doesn't get worse than mortality, right? Um, so mortality is higher in PE backed um, company, PE backed nursing homes. That study I think was pretty convincing. Um, so those would be the, the main reasons. Yeah. I think it's hugely important. Yeah, I mean, it's just another factor that um, that I think bolsters the case uh, for the FTC in in some of their antitrust cases, right? That um, that they are also talking about the problem of of non compete clauses. Um, so yeah, I think it's hugely important. That said, I'm also I'm very um, I don't think relying on uh, antitrust to solve these larger problems that the uh, private capital investments have created in our system is, is gonna be anywhere near sufficient. Um, and I think the reason for that is one, I think, it, it, so I just said that uh, I don't, we don't have a good competitive marketplace for, um, for healthcare in the US. So we have this, in my view, kind of an odd thing with the FTC in the case of healthcare, where they intervene when there's anti-competitive behavior um, to try to create a competitive marketplace. But I don't think we have any good examples of real good competition in healthcare. Um, so it's kind of, it, it's to me, it's, it's a little bit of an irony. We also have cross-cutting forces in our healthcare system, right? So we have some policies coming from Congress that encourage, um, encourage cooperation, right? And, and in the ACA was written um, these uh, incentives for what could be called cooperations to increase continuity of care. What cooperation ended up looking like was integrated, vertical integration, right? And the idea was, right, hospitals should be working with physician groups, should be working with you know, behavioral health providers, et cetera. That all sounds great if you have a planned system, but when you don't have a planned system and we we're pretend, and we have a competitive system, that integrated consolidation means now they're a monopoly and they act like a monopoly by increasing prices, um, you know, lowering, uh, they, they have more command over the salaries of these other entities they've now acquired. Um, so, you know, it's just like, this is a real problem, I think, with people, when we see anti-competitive behavior, we say, oh, we need antitrust, we need antitrust, as if that's gonna solve the problem. And I'm very skeptical of that. Um, the other thing, just even if we thought FTC could do it, Biden administration has given them more resources, but it's still nothing, just nothing compared to the resources of the private sector. When they lawyer up, they have so many more resources and lawyers to put on the case than, than the FTC could ever dream of, right? And there, it's not that we don't have smart people working for the FTC, but it's just it's just hollowed out compared to what lawyers look like on the private side. And just to give you one example of that, I was looking at you know, cases, because I was interested in the role of PE behind some of these FTC and a competitive behavior cases. And from 2010 to 2020, you know, they were behind half of them. But just an, an example of lawyering up. So, you know, there was one case uh, with pharma, um, a pharmaceutical company, and the FTC said, you have to go generic. Um, you've reached, you're done with your patent. 
they argued that they had their formulary was sufficiently different. So I'm sure many of you have heard about this problem where they change the formula just slightly, and then we'll say they have a new drug that's still under the patent. And FTC was arguing against that and saying, no, you don't truly have a new drug. It's time to open this up to a competitive market. Well, the firm was successful in delaying the just a number of delay tactics by saying uh, the hearing was in the wrong court. It was a biased court. They were able to delay it for seven years. And so when it finally went to court, their, the patent, um, this new patent was, was expired. And so the FTC then said, well, okay, it, we're, it's, it's a new case now. And they were fined, but the fine was just minuscule compared to the profits they made in those seven years. So that's just an example of what I mean by lawyering up and the tactics they can use against the FTC. So. Yeah, I know that was, have we reached time? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, were those some of your fellows? Did you did you still want to be? Did they? Oh, they okay. okay.